you know, any time that you hear accusation against yourself, God, or others, you can be guaranteed that that's not God. And in fact, really what it is, is that that's the, that's the, that's the, um, the plan of the enemy to, to pull you away. And, and really what it is, if you really boil it down to the, to the bottom, it's really the enemy's fear speaking because he knows his time is short. So, so every time he speaks to you through ac in, in accusation about yourself, others, or God, he is really fearful. And that's why he's doing this because he wants to take you down with him. God never speaks through accusation. And he never tempts you, ever. So when temptation comes to follow accusation or, or anything, like Pastor Benny was talking, to drift, make you drift back to your old ways that maybe you had fulfillment in, or maybe that was your, maybe that was your, your, your armor or whatever before you knew the Lord, those thoughts are coming straight from the enemy. Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody when they never stopped talking? They just keep talking and talking and talking and talking. And it's really bad on speakerphone, okay? Because you are not going to get a word in edgewise, okay? You are not. Because any sound, even if they go, if they're talking, yeah, and the weather was great, and so I don't. Even if they just do that, you're, you can't get into the conversation because it just takes over the whole airway. That's what the enemy is doing. He just keeps bombarding you, bombarding you, bombarding you, bombarding you. So you can't get a word in edgewise. So the thing to do about that is you just kind of do like our skit in him. We live, we move and we have our being and you just keep doing that. I mean, and yes, I, I mean, for myself, I pull on, I pull on scripture and me a lot of times it's songs. That's why I sang the whole way around this room in him. We live and move. This is the day, this is the, any time the enemy starts, or I'll say for it is written, whatever the case may be. But the reality is that the devil wants your mind to be so tired that you just kind of just like, let it just come through. No, you've got to, you've got to be on the aggressive, you know, when, when the, eventually he'll stop. Eventually, if you don't let, if you don't listen to him, but you can't pretend not to listen to him, okay? Because you're sometimes you just you just go, I'm pretending like I'm not listening to him, but he doesn't think I'm listening to him. But he knows what he's causing in your biology. He knows what he's doing. No, you gotta you gotta be violently against him. You gotta say, No, I don't believe that. That is not the word of God. I cast that down. Now you might have to do that for a while, you know, but let him get tired of your voice. You know, let him get sick and tired of you praising God every time he opens his mouth. Sometimes the word doesn't come readily. Fine praise. Thank you, God. I'm so grateful for blah, 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 blah. And you're trying to accuse blah, blah, blah to me. Well, I just bless them in this day. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for this is the day that the Lord has made. A couple points. The Bible says only God and the man know the thoughts of a man's heart. Listen carefully. Only God and the man know the thoughts of a man's heart. That means Satan and his kingdom cannot read your minds. Now, many people do spiritual warfare on the inside through internalizing thought, but the enemy never hears it. The enemy only knows what, if you've heard him, by how you act, speak, act, and what you do. So he'll try to program you to follow that thought, but it's not for good. And he, then he'll give you another thought and another thought to lead you down this highway. So you have to understand that if you're, if you're going to defeat that in kingdom that's talking to you, you may, feel, you may feel perhaps this is a little radical, but you need to speak it out loud. At your homes, if you have fear coming to you, have doubt coming to you, have self-hatred or guilt, say, no, I'm not receiving that thought in Jesus' name. I know the source of that thought. I'm casting it down. You're that kingdom trying to influence me. I speak to you in Jesus' name. No way I'm going to listen to you any further. That is the violent taking it by force. That is you 
because that kingdom doesn't know a thing that's in your mind unless you speak it out loud. I hear a silent church. I'm hearing a silent church, but when it says resist the devil and he shall flee, that's not internalizing that thought. That is speaking it out loud. And when you speak it out loud, you establish it in the earth, not just in heaven. I said, when you speak it out loud, the word of God against your enemy, you're establishing the things that are in heaven and making that in the earth. And if you establish it in the earth as it is in heaven, then heaven and earth are in agreement with you, and that enemy is in trouble. Now, if you use it as a mantra, if you use it as a, like, you know, a cliche or a, a rote, that's not from the heart. So, you know, don't come out with your plastic swords. You know, the insidiousness of the enemy, too, is that every person that calls himself a believer always wants to do it God's way. That's really what they really want to do, okay? Do they always do it that way? No, okay? So the enemy knows that, but so do you. You know that you don't always do it God's way, but you want to do it God's way. So because of the doubt of, am I doing it God's way? then the enemy comes in and shows you how you're not doing it God's way, okay? Well, I can assure you that the enemy is not telling you how you're supposed to do it correctly because, yes, there may be something within you that's not perfected yet. Oh, well, but that's between you and your Father God. The enemy is not here to instruct you. The Word is. That's who is supposed to instruct you. So he takes this little bit of self-doubt, or maybe a lot, whatever the case may be, and he says, yeah, but if you, sh if you, if you just had done it this way, I trust, I can, I can tell you with all authority that however the enemy is telling you to do it is not right. <laughs> it never will be. It never will be right. Okay, so why are we listening to him? Because he might be right. No, he's never right. Never right. He may have a little bit of information, just like gossip is, and make this whole scenario that might, there might be one element of truth, but it's certainly not enough to give, the, give you the whole game, okay? And he builds this huge thing, whether it's an accusation against yourself, others, or God, and says, this is the way it's supposed to be, because he found some little thing in you, or a big thing, and says, see, you failed here, so let me show you the truth of this matter. He's never right. Never right. Even if he when, brings you thoughts, they're never right. And don't forget that when <clears throat> Satan tempted Jesus, he quoted Scripture. So the enemy can quote Scripture, change it, twist it, to yep. make it sound right, to get you down just a little off track. Oh, yeah. And he can make it sound so good. I mean, if you didn't know the word of God, reading how he was tempting Jesus, you think, well, that sounds, that's, that's true. He should be able to just cast himself down, shouldn't he? Because, I mean, after all, look who he is. If you didn't know that that was tempting God, you would just fall right into it too. That's how easy it is. So I'm just saying those thoughts between your ears, I mean, I tell on the devil all the time, Nathan Henry. I tell, I said, you know what, you want to hear what the devil just said to me? So, so that, so that we, I can get it out of my head. We can do what we got to do together and get rid of that thought. And sometimes when he's talking to you and you're doing your little warfare and he doesn't leave, mm -hmm. even if it's in the nighttime. That's right. You tell him. What are you telling him? I'm going to tell my husband on you. I'm going to wake him up and tell and my gonna husband on you. And we're going to get together here and we're going to handle this. And usually that enemy is gone just like that. Because that enemy doesn't want to deal with me as a covering. I've even said sometimes when the enemy has come to accuse somebody to me, and they're, I mean, this is blatant. It's just going on and on, and I haven't done it. I haven't said, get behind me, Satan, or nothing like that. Finally, I go, thank you so much for reminding me I needed to pray for that person. That's fantastic. Okay, so in the name of Jesus, and I mean, seriously. And so you know, that's the kind of stuff. After a while, you know, that they're not gonna, he's not going to do that anymore. I have a scripture coming. What's that scripture? Thanks for asking. <laughs> no problem. When a man says he is tempted, let him not say that he is tempted of God. Because God does not tempt man with evil, neither can he be tempted with it. But every man is drawn away 
of his own lust. And when lust hath conceived, it bring forth death. Do not err, brethren. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you reap, if you sow unto the things of the flesh, you shall reap the things of the flesh. If you sow unto the things of the Spirit, you shall reap the things of the Spirit. And let's go back in this scripture and drill down to, and when lust hath conceived. That word lust does not mean sexual in the context here. may include that. But it has to do, the word lust means literally in the Greek, whatever you set your affections on. Whatever you set your affections on. And, and that's really what happened with Cain. Cain was in rejection. He was in, re in rejection. He was in anger. And that began to fester. And he began to have feelings of murderous thoughts about his brother. And, and he began to have an affection for the death of his brother. And in that state, he killed his brother. Because lust had conceived and brought forth death. That lust that was filtering down through Peter. The Lord warned Peter, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. Peter, Satan is going to give you thoughts to get your affections on something that's not true. And you know what happened. Peter swore, he cursed, he denied he even knew the Lord. You know his story, don't you? So right here we have, we have the challenge where you're at. But the issue is this. God wants us to take ownership of our lives. Because if you say that being a Christian or a believer is somehow going to make you immune to temptation, you are deceived already. Secondly, if you follow the ways of the commercial church, that instead of calling that an evil spirit that's tempting the person by its fallen nature, they just said, well, you're really the problem. You have a negative emotion. You have psychological defect. You need a drug or inner healing or counseling. While the enemy is laughing his head off because no one is even saying, you're the source of the thought. And most people now struggle with self-hatred, self-accusation, because even their leaders are saying, you're the problem. You just need to get a grip. This is not mind over matter. This is a battle. This is a war. And you need to be wiser than a serpent, harmless as a dove. And you need to take ownership of your lives beginning spiritually and psychologically. And that is, I think, the message that the Lord wants you to hear here today in this assembly. If you wanted a word from the Lord, I think you got it. You know, I was thinking that, you know, accusation and temptation, you know, there's such a, we painted such a huge picture, but, you know, it finds the thing that's within you that's not renewed. Good. That's what it, that's what it's and it wants to, and it wants to say it again. It finds the thing that's in you that's not renewed. Accusation and temptation. And what it does is it tries to it tempts you to listen to accusation and what it's saying because it wants to feed that thing in you so that it's really nice and healthy. And you'll know cuz you'll feel it because when rejection hears something that's going to be rejecting it, it goes it just starts to feel the feeling that rejection has. And so it gets nice, fat, and sassy. Okay? And it's like, yeah, oh, yeah. And you're lulled into this because you're, cause your spirit man is being, is being robbed from. Because this thing is not supposed to be there. It's a parasite. Scripture coming fast. Go for it. King David, Psalm 51. Oh, Lord, renew within me a right spirit. Search me, try my reins to see if there be any wicked thing within me. Amen. Folks, come on. That made him a man after God's own heart. And this is coming after he got a married woman pregnant and had her husband killed. There's hope for us, isn't there? The issue is this. He, he, he had thoughts. He fell. He recovered himself. But he said, search me. Amen. Well, you know, oftentimes you don't have to be searched too far. You already know. But if you would think of these things that are this unrenewed part of you, it's not you. It's not even you, okay? That it's a parasite that needs fed. And this accusation 
feeds it all the time. It feeds, it feeds, it feeds it. No, you need to defeat it. You need to kill it. Don't let it listen to this stuff. You've, you, you, have to, you have to fight this thing back because the source of the feeding is what's going to pull you down. You need to get this stuff out of your life. How can you get it out of your life if you're listening to it all the time? You can't get it out of your life. That's why the word of God, the washing the water, the word is just so, it's, it, it's life to you. It is your life. Good stuff. King David, when he was on his palace roof, and he looked next door, and there was Bathsheba. That thought that came to him, he thought was him. And he followed it as it was him. And it got him in big trouble, didn't it? But when you look at his repentance in Psalm 51, he said this, In sin my mother did conceive me. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. Looking back at his failure, he realized that the thought he had, he had it when he was conceived. It was in his family tree. And it was, it was already tracking in the family tree and it already was manifesting in his own family. Later, he had one son, raped his own sister. And look at Solomon's insatiable appetite for female flesh. I have to say something. You see? I do, but I have to say something about that. And, I, and, and I, I'm, I've never said it to you, so you can judge this. Is that when I hear that story, and I think of what happened with Bathsheba, I think about David as a man and how he had grown up as a humble man through the shepherd fold and all the way up, and now he's king. And I think there comes, a, please hear what I'm saying. I think that there comes a place in either age, either in, as a believer that I've got this far, um, and it, that there, becomes, there comes a place of entitlement. Well, that's what the prophet said to David. And you're, so, you're on target. And so, and so what happened, so he thought that the sin that he was going to be doing, because he followed his heart, that somehow he was entitled to take what he wanted. And that's what the prophet, Remember when the prophet told came him. to him. You took something, David, that did not, did not belong, belong to, to you, you just because you were king. Did not give you the right to take something that did not belong to you. And so uh, that, to me, is just a huge warning to us as believers that we get to a certain maybe age in our understanding or maybe you are a boss on a job or, or whatever it looks like that there's a certain entitlement that comes to you that you don't have to walk in his ways just as strictly as maybe someone else. But that is not true because too much is given, much is required. I cannot tell you how many times people have tried to lure me away by things they said that I was entitled to. And I'm not entitled to it. I, I mean, seriously. I, I you know, you, you who should, be, you know, think that you should be first, you are the least. You know, I mean, least should be first, that kind of thing. So I'm just, I get really a little leery there because I know David felt entitled just a bit to be able to take what he wanted. And didn't count the cost of it. Now he did find he did count the cost. Hallelujah! He said, "Please don't take your Holy Spirit from me," because that he got his. Oh my goodness, what was I thinking? Oh my goodness, you know. And but and see, the, but see that Holy Spirit when he said, "Take not thy Holy Spirit from me," it was that Holy Spirit that c caused mm -hmm. him to recover. Is the same Holy Spirit that caused Peter to recover? Absolutely, absolutely. So my concern every day is remember we had that conversation at the living room about grace. It's the divine influence on the heart. It's like, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. I want the divine influence on the heart. But if you become so calloused in your heart not to hear him. Didn't finish the definition of grace this morning when we started. It just took off with having fun. But grace is God's divine influence on the heart in this reflection in this thing called life. You know what we learned in our in our, our study there is that the word the definition of grace is in Christianity is unmerited favor. You know the word unmerited favor is not found in Hebrew to English nor Greek to English. Guess where the word unmerited favor came from into Christianity? Webster's dictionary. Oops. 
<laughs> That's a real spiritual place.